Do you know why the Lord saved you from the bondage of sin? After my sermon last week, where we took a look at the choice of being a servant of sin or a servant of the Lord, I sat and I began to think. And I gave some thought to God giving us the opportunity at liberty, the opportunity at freedom under his grace. How often do you stop to think about how special it is for you to be able to reside, to be able to dwell under God's amazing grace? Now, when all of us, when you who live under the liberty of God's grace, when you stop and when you think about it for a moment, you you will realize just how special you have it. You will realize just how special a reward it is to be able to dwell under God's grace. Now, there used to be this one question that would roam around in my head Mm -hmm. that I would often ask myself and that I would often ask the Lord. And that question would be, why do you care about me, Lord? Why? Why did you choose to care about me? And again, I don't know if any of you have ever thought that or if any of you have asked the Lord that. You see, it made little sense to me that God cared about me because in my eyes, I don't think I'm all that special. I'm not too full of myself to believe that I am that special of a person for the Lord to care about me. And so in my mind, I began to ask the Lord and I began to think to myself, Why does God care about me? Now, I don't ask myself that question all that much anymore. And the reason why I don't ask myself that question all that much anymore is because I've spent many years in scripture. I have spent many years studying and I've spent many years growing to understand the reason as to why the Lord chose to save me. And why the Lord chose to save you and why he has given the rest of mankind the opportunity to be saved. Now, I tell you today, I am still blown away at the fact that the Lord finds me to be special enough to be saved. I'm still blown away at the fact that God cares about me. However, I now know why the Lord loves me and I now know why the Lord cares about me. Now, some of you may still be wondering why the Lord cares about you. Some of you may still have questions and wonder why the Lord saved you. Mm -hmm. And I tell you today that there is absolutely nothing wrong with asking and, and wondering that thought, because I believe that the Lord is going to give you the same answer Mm -hmm. that he has given to me. Now, I believe it is likely that our first response would be the common response as to why the Lord saved us. We would say that the Lord saved us because he loved us and that he did not want us to perish to sin. Now, there is, of course, nothing wrong with this response because this response is certainly right. However, I believe that there is more to it. Come on. I believe that there is more to the reasoning as to why the Lord chose to save both you and me. Yes, the Lord loved us and he desired to save us from the bondage of sin. Yet there is something. Mm -hmm. There is something more that the Lord desires of us. Mm -hmm. There is something more that the Lord desires of you. So this week, I want us to focus on that reason. I want us to focus more on why the Lord saved us from the bondage of sin. Now, here in our key verse for this week's sermon, Mm -hmm. 
we see that Paul speaks to Timothy further about the, why the Lord chose to save him and therefore why the Lord chose to save the rest of us who choose to follow Christ from the bondage of sin. Let us first notice here what Paul says of his past self to Timothy there in the 13th verse. Mm -hmm. Paul first tells Timothy there that he was formerly a blasphemer. Yeah. <clears throat> he wasn't trying to hide anything here from Timothy. Now, a blasphemer we know is defined as one who speaks or acts in a way that shows irreverence for the Lord. Mm -hmm. When I say irreverence there, I mean a lack of honor for God or a total disregard of the Lord. Now in his days prior to meeting Christ, Paul would have never said this about himself. He would have never called himself a blasphemer. Come on, come on. See, Paul, he was raised to know he was raised to abide by the law. Yeah, yeah. Not only was Paul raised to know and to abide by the law, he was a practitioner of the law. Not only was he a practitioner of the law, Paul was also an enforcer of the law as well. Amen. So like many of the religious leaders around that point in time, Paul did not recognize God's only begotten son. Come on. Come on. He did not recognize Jesus Christ. So with that in mind, we will see there in the 13th verse mm -hmm. that all that Paul also pointed out to Timothy that he was also a bold persecutor mm -hmm. of those that sought to have faith of those that sought to practice the way of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To the Galatians, Paul, he also admitted that he not only sought to persecute the church of God, mm -hmm. he also sought to destroy the church of God. Mm -hmm. So at that time, Paul, while he sought to persecute the church of God, mm -hmm. and while he sought to destroy the church of God, Paul, he may have felt that what he was doing was right. Yeah because he was a man that lived by the law mm -hmm. and the law was given by the Lord. Yes, sir. However, while he did not realize it at that time, Paul was living in a manner mm -hmm. of sin. All right. He was living as a sinner mm -hmm. where he was disregarding, where he was despising the Lord. Yeah. Now, while Paul was despising the Lord by all of the things that he was doing to mm -hmm. the church, mm -hmm. we'll see there in the 14th verse that Paul points something out about the Lord. All right. Paul, he pointed out there in the 14th verse, he pointed out God's grace towards him. All right. yeah. Paul, he tells Timothy there in that verse, he says there, the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant. Mm -hmm. While Paul was persecuting the church, trying to destroy the church of God, Paul tells us that the Lord's grace right. was exceedingly abundant. Says with well, faith and love, which are again in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, I don't want you to underestimate there what Paul has said about the Lord's grace there. All right. You see, Paul, he wants you to know that the Lord God's grace was amazing. Mm -hmm. You see, Paul, again, he was a very harsh man towards those who believed in Christ, mm -hmm. towards those that worshiped and followed the way of Christ. Again, to show you just how much of a sinner Paul was, we'll see there in the 15th verse, mm -hmm. we'll see there that Paul tells Timothy that he was a chief mm 
of sinners. So Paul was telling Timothy there that, hey, I wasn't no little sinner. I was a big sinner. In fact, I was a chief of sinners there. So again, I don't want you to underestimate just how much of a sinner Paul was. And when you realize how big of a sinner Paul was, you'll realize that God's grace for him was totally amazing. So don't underestimate God's grace for one second, not even for half of a second or a tenth of a second. Do not underestimate God's amazing grace. See, I want you to understand today that Paul wasn't the only big sinner. I believe I'm in a room of big sinners as well. And, And I believe today that I live in a world that is filled with big sinners as well. All right. yeah. Don't nobody feel bad because I'm calling myself a big sinner as well. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Again, we'll see Paul tell us there in our key verse All right. that he obtained God's grace, mm-hmm. his mercy. Yeah. He tells us that he obtained the Lord's grace and mercy for a reason there. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we see Paul gives us there in our key verse for today is so that Christ might show all long suffering, that Mm -hmm. is patience and mercy Mm -hmm. as a pattern, as a pattern to those who are going to believe in him for everlasting life, a pattern Paul says there. So in other words, Paul tells us that the Lord saved him so that he could be an example, if you will, an example for all of those who were around him, an example of the Lord's grace, an example of God's mercy to all of those who were around him and to all of those who would live ages after him. To even us today and to those who will come after us tomorrow. I don't know if you hear me here today. Now, I feel I must ask you today whether or not you believe that God saved you for the very same reason. You see, all of us were sinners. And we still sin today as well, but we are justified sinners. You see, all of us were sinners and through the Lord's amazing grace, God Mm -hmm. saved us Mm -hmm. through his amazing grace. God saved you from the bondage of sin. And I tell you today that he did it for a purpose. Mm -hmm. He saved you for a reason, not just so that you can inherit eternal life, but so that you could be an example, a pattern to all of those that are around you and to all of those who will come through you and after you. I don't know if you hear me here today. I don't know if you get what I'm saying here today. You see, we were saved so that we can have eternal life, but the Lord saved us to be an example of his amazing grace. Mm -hmm. So as an example of God's amazing grace, what are you doing today? What are you doing with God's amazing grace today? Mm -hmm. How do you go about living in it? How do you go about setting that example of God's amazing grace today? Mm -hmm. Do you live in a manner where you disregard and despise the Lord's amazing grace? Mm -hmm. Or are you living in a manner where you cherish it? Are you living in a manner where you honor it? Mm -hmm. Are you living in a manner where you respect the grace that God has towards you? How are you living today in the Lord's amazing grace is what I ask you. Boy, I love asking questions spiritually. I love making you think 
I love making you wonder and I love making you ask yourself these things because we have to answer these things of ourself and we have to be able to make the correction if we are not doing these things. Now, as a child of God, we should certainly not be disregarding or despising the Lord's grace. No, we should be doing otherwise, shouldn't we? We should be cherishing it. We should be honoring it. We should be cherishing and honoring the grace for which we were saved today. So we'll see Paul speak to Timothy about how we ought to go about honoring and being that pattern, being that example of the Lord's grace in our world today for all people to see. Within this chapter of his first letter to Timothy, we'll see there in the 18th verse, we'll see that Paul, he charges Timothy there to wage the good warfare. Paul says, have you ever realized that Paul said that to Timothy? He did say it later on in this same letter in the sixth chapter and the 12th verse Mm -hmm. to Timothy again, he said, fight the good fight of faith. I know we done heard that one before. So Paul, he was encouraging Timothy to do good. Mm -hmm. He was encouraging Timothy to take a stand for what is right and what is just and what is good in the eyes of God against all that is wicked and all that stands in opposition of the Lord. Now, I feel that we need to understand what Paul meant when he used the words of warfare and fighting, Mm -hmm. because some will take that to mean, hey, I ought to go out and physically fight. I I should go out and physically pick up a weapon so that I can fight for the Lord. See, I, I, I say this today that the Lord, he did not mean for us to literally go out and to physically punch somebody, to beat somebody up or mm-hmm. to to walk around with a sword or even a gun, killing and trying to destroy wickedness in that manner. You see, Paul, he did, my, did not mean for us to physically combat those who we may think are wicked, those who we may think are sinners. Paul was not telling anybody to physically fight and wage war with their hands or with weapons there. We will see here in scripture that Paul tells us there in the 11th verse that the good warfare or the good fight of faith, if you will, is to pursue righteousness, to pursue godliness, to pursue faith, to pursue love, patience and gentleness. Now, if you look at those words there, if you look at those words there, none of that sounds like anything that has to do with physical combat, does it? The best way that we can honor and be an example of the Lord's amazing grace that he has shown to us is to do just what Paul said there, to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Now, when we take a look at those adjectives, you see our idea for what physical warfare ought to go out the window because those adjectives there, they simply don't fit physical warfare or physical combat. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I want you to understand today that all these words are not simply just adjectives. These words are verbs as well. See, these words are verbs or actions that the servant of God ought to act out of as well. All right. All right. You see, the servant of God ought to move out of righteousness. Mm -hmm. Do you hear me there? So we ought to act out of righteousness. We ought to move with godliness. We ought to move with faith. Mm -hmm. We ought to move with love. We ought to move with patience. Mm -hmm. We ought to move with gentleness Mm -hmm. towards all people. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the question that we must now answer is this. How do we go about doing this? How do we go about putting these words into action so that we are being that example of God's amazing grace? Mm-hmm. Now, in order for us to be the best example of the grace of, that God has shown towards us, I would ask, should we not first follow in his example of grace? Right. If we are to move out of God's amazing grace. Mm-hmm. Should we look at how the Lord first moved, mm-hmm. how he moved towards us? Mm-hmm. So let us consider how the Lord has dealt with all of us today. How has God dealt with you? Mm-hmm. Let us consider for a moment. Does the Lord deal with you harshly? Has God ever done wrong by you? Has God treated you harshly is what I ask today. I hear no, sir. And I hear uh uh-uh. And I see shaking uh, the head. Now, we say uh uh-uh. We say no, no, sir. Nope. We give an answer of no, but there are some who may actually answer this question and say that the Lord has dealt with them harshly, believe it or not. There is someone somewhere today that believes that God is doing them wrong. Now we all said, uh-uh, we all said no, but there are times where we even begin to wonder, Hey God, what you doing? That's just, that is truth. No matter how much you will say, oh, no, preacher, not true. I, God ain't never did wrong by me. We have had moments where we began to wonder ourselves, Lord, where you at? Yes, sir. Yeah. Why am I suffering right now? All right. Why is all of this happening to me? It ought not be happening to me. I know y'all done heard me say that before. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> mm-hmm. Some may actually answer the question and say that the Lord has dealt harshly towards them. However, I will point out to you today that the Lord does not deal harshly with us. God does not deal harshly with you. Mm -hmm. See, everything that we see in scripture about the Lord's thoughts, his feelings and his actions towards us, his children, they point to the fact that the Lord loves his children and that he does nothing but treats us out of that very love. He treats us out of that grace. God is love Mm -hmm. to the Romans. Paul wrote that the Lord demonstrated his love towards all people in that while we were sinners, we are given an opportunity through his only begotten son. Towards the justified believer. That is us today. Mm -hmm. Paul wrote that the Lord demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for you. Mm -hmm. So if the Lord loved us while we were nothing but sinners, I can only imagine today how much the Lord loves you as a child of his. How dare we think for one second that God would deal harshly with us who are a child of his. I don't know if you hear me. Now, David, he he often spoke of the Lord's grace in Psalms. And on quite a few occasions, he would speak to how the Lord is both merciful and gracious. He would speak to how the Lord is slow to anger. And he would speak to how the Lord abound in mercy. It was plentiful, if you will. I want you to understand that David was not simply saying something that he had heard. Come on. 
David, he was speaking from what he had lived, yes, what he had known and learned through his own personal relationship. That is his own personal fellowship mm -hmm. with the Lord. You see, I too can testify through my own personal fellowship, my own personal relationship with the Lord today, that in all of my sin, God has never left me. God has never forsaken me. God has never forgotten about me. God has still loved me. I don't know about you today, but that's how the Lord is with me today. See, David said this about the Lord, but I can do one better than David's testimony of God's grace. I can do better than my own personal testimony of God's grace. I can go directly to the source yeah. when it comes to the Lord's grace. Mm -hmm. Let us go directly to the Lord's testimony of himself. Right. In the book of Exodus, mm -hmm. specifically the 34th chapter and the sixth and the seventh verse, mm -hmm. We'll see there in that chapter that the Lord had commanded Moses to make two new stone tablets All right. after the first were destroyed because of the sin of the children of Israel. And in this 34th chapter of Exodus, we're told that the Lord, he descended in a cloud of glory and he stood with Moses. Mm -hmm. And as the Lord stood there with Moses, we see that the Lord, he began to proclaim and he began to testify of himself. And there in the sixth and the seventh verse, we see that the Lord said, the Lord, the Lord God, mm -hmm. he says they're merciful and gracious speaking and testifying of himself there. He says, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. These were things that the Lord said and testified of himself. This is God's testimony. Yeah. Not man's testimony. All right. God, he tells us himself that he is gracious. Mm -hmm. God tells us himself that he is patient, that he is merciful, and that he is forgiven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. If that is not enough for you, mm -hmm. we know that God then came to the world yeah. in the flesh. And he told us again that he is not a harsh master to serve. Mm -hmm. Jesus, again, being God in the flesh, testified to this when he encouraged us in the 11th chapter of Matthew's gospel in the 28th verse to come to him so that he could give us rest, yeah, yeah. so that he could give us peace, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. See, when Jesus encouraged us to take this action, he let us know that he is gentle, mm -hmm. that he is kind, that he is lowly in art. Mm -hmm. Again, I want you to understand that this was the Lord testifying of himself. Again, I want you to know that this was God speaking of his graciousness, yeah, yeah. his grace, his love towards you, his grace and his love towards me his grace and his love towards all people where some may believe that the Lord deals harshly with them. We must understand that he is not being harsh towards us. Yes. The Lord, he will offer us his rebuke. He will offer us his correction so that when we do wrong, we don't continue to do wrong. The Lord does not want us to fall down into sin after he has picked us up from sin. You see, in his rebuke, God is always uplifting us. God is always encouraging us to do and to be a better person. Yeah, yeah. 
See, I'm of the belief that there is absolutely nothing harsh about wanting us to be a better person. That sounds like love to me. See, if God did not care about us, he would just continue to let us go off and do whatever it is that we was doing. He would never pick us up from sin. He would never uplift us. He would never encourage us to be better. That's what I learned as a child about my parents. My parents loved me. Okay. Mm-hmm. They get on me because they love me. Mm-hmm. They want me to be better. Yeah. They don't want me to be a hoodlum, mm-hmm. if you will. <laughs> Just throw it back for you. So if God is not harsh towards us, then we ought not be harsh towards others. Right. If God doesn't do wrong by you, then why should you go off and do wrong by someone else? Mm-hmm. Right. That just doesn't sound right, mm-hmm. especially for the one who calls himself a child of God. We best show the example of the Lord's amazing grace by being gracious towards those that are around us, whether we know them or not. If the Lord does not deal harshly with us again, why should we deal harshly with people that we know and even people that we do not know? You see, this was a lesson that the apostles had to learn when they began to set out fighting that good fight of faith. In the 15th chapter of Acts, we will see there in the 15th chapter of Acts an occasion where Peter, he spoke to the other apostles and Mm -hmm. to those who were elders in how they wanted to deal with Gentile followers of Christ. You see, there was a sect of Pharisees who had began to follow in the way of Christ, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And in their following of Christ, they suggested that the Gentile believers should be made to keep the Mosaic law. They they should also be circumcised as well. All right, all right. You see, there was much dispute among this group as to how they should deal with the Gentile believers. When listening to their dispute, we'll see in the 7th through the 10th verse there in the 15th chapter of Acts, that Peter, he stood to his feet, that he had a word for this group of people. He had a message for them. And after sharing this message, this word with them, Peter, he left them with an all important question. That question being, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Why do you try to burden someone with the burden that you nor your fathers could bear Mm -hmm. is the question that Peter had for the other apostles and for those that were elders. See, the elders and those apostles, they had argued that the Gentile believers, that they should be made to follow the law and to be circumcised. They were essentially going to put affliction. They were going to burden the Gentiles to do what they themselves could not do. Mm -hmm. Now let us remember that the Gentile believers, just like them, they had received God's grace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They had received God's grace through the giving of the Holy spirit, which came by way of Jesus Christ. So keeping the Jews' tradition would have been an unnecessary burden for the Gentile followers of Christ. The apostles and elders, they would have began to deal shrewdly Mm -hmm. with the Gentile believers. In other words, Mm -hmm. they would have began to treat the Gentile believers unjustly Mm -hmm. and unfairly. Not right, Mm -hmm. if you will. The Lord, he does not desire for us to deal shrewdly with anybody. Mm -hmm. He did not desire for those believers to put that burden on other believers. 
God does not desire for us to deal shrewdly with people, whether they believe or don't believe. Mm -hmm. Again, we are to be an example of God's grace. Mm -hmm. The Lord, he does not desire for us to deal shrewdly with anyone as shown to us in Jesus's parable of the unjust steward. Mm -hmm. In that parable, the unjust steward, he wasted his master's good. Mm -hmm. And when it came time to collect those goods, the unjust steward, he began to deal shrewdly with those who owed his master. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, in scripture, in that parable, we're told that the master, he found that pleasing. Mm -hmm. The master was pleased because he himself was just as crooked as that unjust steward. Mm -hmm. You see, they used a worldly mindset mm -hmm. in order to gain. Mm -hmm. Both the unjust steward and the master, I tell you today, that they were of the world and using unjust and unfair tactics to gain that was pleasing in their eyes. They had absolutely no problem with it and they would do it again. That's how the master had got rich most likely in the first place. The Lord, as we know, he is both faithful and just, which means that he is fair. The Lord, he desires to gain, but he does not desire to gain in an unfair and an unjust way, if you will. He saved us so that through our example, others would see his grace. They would see his love and they would come to him in order to be saved. God does not want dirty tactics to be used in order for someone to come to him. Do you see that there today? So if we are going to go out into the world today, and if we are going to be an example of God's amazing grace in our world today, he does not want us to be moving about shrewdly. The Lord does not want you to be treating people the wrong way. God does not want you to be unfair he does not want you to be unjust. The Lord desires for you to be just, yeah, yeah. to be fair, mm -hmm. to be faithful to his word. Mm -hmm. And his word is a word that is of love because again, God is love. Yes, the Lord does not want us to move shrewdly. He wants us to move justly, mm -hmm. graciously. Mm -hmm. He wants us to move mercifully, mm -hmm. gentleness, and with all patience, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the best way we go about doing this is by actively acting out of the same love that God has shown towards us. Mm -hmm. In other words, follow his example. Mm -hmm. That's all we have to do is follow his example. Yeah, yeah. This means that our actions ought to be his and that they ought to set the tone for the example in which we are to set for those that live around us. Mm -hmm. Instead of tearing one another down or burdening each other, we ought to do as the writer of Hebrews wrote when the writer wrote that we are to encourage, that we are to exhort one another daily while it is called today. Mm -hmm. Don't wait till tomorrow. Do it today. Exhort, encourage. You see, we should always be seeking to help one another rather than to tear down or to place a yoke around the neck of somebody. We ought not be seeking to burden someone. We ought to be seeking to lift someone up. I share with you today something that we already know. A good support system will always keep you lifted up would always keep you lifted up when times are good, would always keep you up certainly when times are rough. Yeah, yeah. See, during this month especially, I always think of what mom, dad, and my aunts and uncles and what my grandparents, what they spoke of when they spoke of how uplifting the black community was to one another many, many, many years ago. 
when they were coming along the way. Mm -hmm. now, some of that support, it still exists today somewhat, but, but there is a lot of tearing down that goes on around us today. Mm -hmm. And I believe that is very shameful mm -hmm. that instead of building up, we often tear one another down. All right. All right. There's a, a lot of tearing down that goes on not among just the black community, but all communities today, mm -hmm. regardless of race today. The thought of all people coming together today to uplift one another seems like nothing but a dream to me. Mm -hmm. However, the Lord has always desired for mankind to do just that. God has always desired for us to uplift each other. God has always desired for us to uplift each other and for us to, to be better people by doing just that. And you better believe that the Lord expects for the child of God to be the one that is leading the charge in edifying and uplifting all of those that are around them. Right. You see, as believers, we are called to edify each other especially when one is in the wrong or when one may be down in their spirits. Mm -hmm. In Matthew's gospel, when one is in the wrong, Jesus, he told us that we should take them to the side. Mm -hmm. We should take them to the side and that we should offer them correction. And should they hear us, Jesus said that we will have gained, we will have gained our brother. We will have gained one. James, in his letter, he spoke to how we should help the one who may wander from the truth. Yeah. And James, he said that should we help one who has wandered, who has strayed from the truth, we will have saved a soul from death. Mm -hmm. All of this, again, speaks to how we as believers, how we should act out of God's amazing grace. Look at what God's amazing grace is capable of doing. God's amazing grace is not only capable of saving you, but it is capable of saving all of those that are around you, whether you know them or not. Whether they are family, friend, or stranger, God's amazing grace can save anybody. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh -huh. Yes, it is good for us to have a good support system around us, but I feel I must ask today, are you part of someone's good support system? Are you as a child of God? Are you part of someone's good support system? Mm -hmm. If not, I tell you today, something has gone wrong. And I tell you today, and I'm not, and I'm not going to hold back on this. Mm -hmm. Something has gone wrong with you. Mm -hmm. Because if you really are a child of God, you ought to be that pattern. You ought to be that example of God's grace for somebody, that example that will uplift, that example that will get somebody back on the right track. Yes. So are you part of someone's good support system? If not, get there. Become, some, become part of someone's good support system today. The Lord has saved us so that his pattern of long suffering of grace and mercy can be seen through us. Mm -hmm. And the best way that we can be that example of God's amazing grace and mercy is by sharing it and by being that grace. Mm -hmm. So I encourage all of you today to support rather than to tear down. Right. We cherish, honor, and respect the Lord's grace when we move in his grace. Mm -hmm. And again, to do otherwise would be to despise the Lord and as a child of God, we ought not be despising the Lord. We ought not be despising his grace. We ought not be despising his mercy. And the child of God, we ought not be disregarding him. When we disregard him, we move in a way where we are not setting that example that we ought to be setting. So again, I ask, do you know why the Lord saved you today from the bondage of sin? If you know why, 
let us start moving. Let us start acting like we know why. Amen. 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 Amen.